What is up, everybody? This is your boy, Taron Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of Set Point. We have ourselves a busy show today, as we have a lot of volleyball to get into, such as the NBA concluding event number four. We had a lot of upsets, a lot of teams dominating, a lot of shorthanded teams making it do what it do, and all in all, the playoff picture is starting to become clear and clear. And the Big Ten Women's Volleyball Conference schedule has been released. Which teams will be taking on which teams for the right to be called Big Ten Conference Champions? And we got some NCAA Women's Volleyball Conference schedule releases to release, as we'll be breaking down Pepperdine, Nebraska, and Stanford. We also have the U.S. Women's National Volleyball Team going 4-0 in VNL play. Have they surpassed Japan in the standings? Hand me a volleyball. Set up for them, because I'm about to serve you up some volleyball action here on Set Point. This is Taron Rodriguez bringing you another edition of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. Thank you all for joining me on this beautiful Monday afternoon, Monday evening, Monday, whatever you want to call it. I do not care. As long as I am live, I am ready to give you all that volleyball goodness. It is what I do here on IE Sports Radio in addition to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. But without any further delay, let's get on in to that volleyball action. But first and foremost, we have a word from our sponsor. IE Sports Radio is proud to call the Southern California Warriors semi-pro football team the official sponsor of IE Sports Radio. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organization. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's playing to get filmed to trout for professional teams, big-time colleges, or just playing to stay in shape. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's playing for the love of the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to make dreams happen, get people to the next level, and to win championships since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get the second chance you've been waiting for as an athlete. You can follow them on Twitter at SoCalWarriors, on Instagram at SouthernCalifornia underscore Warriors, and on Facebook by typing in the word Southern California and then Warriors. And then IE Sports Radio, our platform, is available on Twitter and Instagram at IE Sports Radio, and then on Facebook by typing in the word IE, then Sports, then Radio. IE Sports Radio also has a website, www.iesportsradio.com, and when you go there, you will see a Patreon link at the top, and when you click that link, it'll start out at $5 a month should you want to donate. This will get you a shout-out from all 28 of our shows, including this one, and then higher tiers will include IE Sports Radio merchandise, access to IESRU, the podcasting university of IE Sports Radio, and even a chance to be featured on IE Sports Radio's flagship show, The Defining Moment, with the founder of IE Sports Radio, Larry B. Because for the past eight years, IE Sports Radio has been bringing you amazing content, ranging from interviewing legendary athletes, coaches, and other authorized media personnel, to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all major sports and cities around the country. All the while, I Sports Radio has been continuing to be by the fans and for the fans, and with your help, we are ready to take the next biggest step. Thank you to everyone for all of your support and for continuing to make I Sports Radio your direct feed for all that sports. Big shout to our Patreon supporters, Bay Area Raised Apparel, Marcus Los Great, Key to the Gate, and an, an anonymous supporter. Also, we would like to give a shout to everyone that made our 8th anniversary special. Here's to more anniversaries and more celebrations to come. Also, we would like to give a shout to iSports Radio's Fan of the Month, Justin Ekstrom. He is on Twitter, at the Sports Crib 21 
He is a Minnesota Vikings fan, hailing from the Great Lakes of Minnesota. And with all that said and done, let's get on in to that volleyball goodness. Let's start off with some of the conference, or not the conference, it's the schedule releases, as we actually have three of them. And we're starting to get into the thick of it when it comes to some of these big-time schedules. So we'll start off with Pepperdine, just because they're kind of the non-Power 5 school, and they're always the promising school that is basically on the rise. And the West Coast Conference can be deemed as a semi-Power 5 conference, considering they take quite a bit of teams to the NCAA tournament. Not just its champion, but a couple other teams as well. Maybe four teams at best. But Pepperdine's schedule consists of traveling to Lincoln for the Nebraska Invitational. Starting on August 26th, they will take on Tulsa. And then the following day, or not the following day, Later that day, they'll actually take on Texas A&M Corpus Christi. I actually have to discuss that in a little bit following the schedule releases. Then on August 27th, Pepperdine will take on host Nebraska, which is going to be a huge challenge. I really think that's going to be a barn burner for Pepperdine. It's going to show what they can truly muster up against a perennial powerhouse that also made the NCAA final from last year. And as I alluded to last week when I was breaking down Baylor's schedule, Pepperdine has its ASICS challenge as Pepperdine will be hosting Baylor on September 1st. Then on September 2nd, a Friday, they will play UC Santa Barbara. And then on Saturday, closing out the three-day event, Pepperdine will host San Diego State at noon Pacific time. Then Pepperdine will head up to the Pacific Northwest in Seattle, Washington, for the Alaska Airlines Invitational. They'll start off on September 8th, a Thursday, when they play Cal Poly. And then on September 9th, they will take on Washington, the host school. And then closing out the Alaska Airlines Invitational, they will play Northwestern on that same day, September 9th. So they get quite a bit of a doubleheader. They get a Big Ten team and a Pac-12 team. And that Pac-12 team that Pepperdine's playing is no joke. Speaking of no joke, Pepperdine also will be playing in the Diet Coke Classic in Minneapolis. Speaking of Minneapolis, the host school, Minnesota, will be Pepperdine's first opponent on September 15th. And then the day after, September 16th, Pepperdine will be playing Washington State. And then right out the gate, they have West Coast Conference play, and they get the first two opponents as probably the most brutal draw to start out. So September 22nd, Pepperdine hits the road to beautiful San Diego to take on the Toreros at Jenny Craig Pavilion. Then on Saturday, September 24th, Pepperdine heads up to Provo, Utah to take on BYU, which, again, that's a tough draw. Those are the three teams that made the NCAA tournament last year, and BYU is always good. And then playing San Diego at San Diego is no easy feat as well. Then on September 27th, Pepperdine plays Gonzaga, Then two days after, September 29th, Pepperdine will be hitting the road for the NorCal two-step when they play San Francisco. And then two days after, they will be playing Santa Clara on Saturday, October 1st. Then Pepperdine has a two-game homestand against the other NorCal teams on October 6th, a Thursday. They'll be playing Pacific, and then on October 8th, a Saturday, they'll be playing St. Mary's. Now, the Pacific match could be a trap game, just because Pacific is pretty legit. As Mike Pat in the chat room, he says, the best volleyball podcast is on tonight. I appreciate that, Mike. And he also says, West Coast, East Coast, Big Ten, it doesn't matter. FSU in four? Uh, We'll see about that, buddy. Um, FSU always has a great team. They do return quite a bit of players, but we'll see if Florida State can stack up to the entire ACC. Speaking of which, I do have some Florida State beach volleyball news that I'll be break that I'll be discussing in a little bit. But back to Pepperdine women's volleyball. So October fifteenth, a Saturday is their next match following the St. Mary's matchup. They'll be taking on their PCH rival, LMU, as they'll be hitting the road to LA to take on Loyola Marymount. And then on October 20th, Pepperdine will also be hitting the road for the Northwest Territory 
two-step as on October 20th, Pepperdine plays at Portland, and then on October 22nd, Pepperdine is at Gonzaga. Then they'll be heading back home to take on the NorCal schools, Santa Clara and San Francisco, on October 27th and 29th. Then on November 3rd and 5th, Pepperdine heads down to NorCal to take on St. Mary's and Pacific. Then they have the last four matches at home, starting on November 12th, where they take on LMU, their PCH rival. And then on November 17th, Pepperdine plays BYU. November 19th, Pepperdine is home against San Diego. And then November 22nd, Pepperdine closes out the regular season against Portland. So for Pepperdine, here's my thing. They're going to be challenged early on, and I think this is finally good for them. Do I expect Pepperdine to honestly win some of those matches against Washington and Nebraska? I doubt it. I don't think they'll beat those two schools, but Northwestern is always a decent challenge. Minnesota, I don't think they'll get the win over, but... I'm sure they'll probably challenge them, considering Minnesota did lose Stephanie Samity to graduation. And then the Washington State one, I think is kind of a coin flip. I think Washington State does have that potential. I talked about Washington State and how they returned seven of their standout players from last season. Well, they returned seven players overall, and then they returned four of those players that led some of their categories, such as kills and digs and whatnot. But for me, I think Pepperdine is going to get a great test to start off the West Coast Conference with San Diego and BYU. I think it's a great pivot to start out the West Coast Conference. If they go 1-1, one and one, then so be it. But it would, also, it would be a huge to pick up at least one of those road wins. Like, that would just be a momentum booster going into the rest of conference play. I really don't think Pepperdine is a bad team. I think they're going to have success this season. I really think Pepperdine has good players, and I think they have a great coaching staff, also assistant coach and former set point guest Steve Astor. And then I think they return quite a bit of players from last year's team as well. Yes, losing Rachel Ahrens does not help matters, but I think they will be better off without her. She obviously was a blue chip player, but Pepperdine does have quite a bit of players such as Grace Chillingworth, Meg Brown. I'm blanking on her name, but it's Ammer- Emma Ammerman. And I'm pretty sure their recruiting class is also promising as well. So overall, I think Pepperdine is going to be in for a promising season this year. So that is the Pepperdine women's volleyball schedule. I think that it's going to be a fun season for the Waves. Jumping on over to the Pac-12 and staying on the West Coast, we have the Stanford women's volleyball schedule that was released. It was actually the first publicly released schedule for from the Pac-12. Obviously, there were some other Pac-12 teams that released their schedules, such as Oregon, Colorado, Washington State, and I think a few others. But for me, Stanford was the one that caught my eye. And they have a lot of stacked matches this season. So they start off the season in Nashville, Tennessee, where they play in the Tennessee State Tournament. They play Lipscomb on Friday, August 26th. And then the day after, Stanford will play host Tennessee State. Then that's where Stanford gets to face the brutal portion of their schedule. Their next five games, or I'm sorry, six games, are all against teams that made the NCAA tournament. And I think most of these teams made it past the first round. So the first brutal test for Stanford will be August 30th when Stanford hits the road to Gainesville to take on Florida. Then on September 4th, a Sunday, Stanford will be heading back home to... Maples Pavilion to take on Texas, which should be a Texas-sized matchup. Then they Stanford has the Pac-12 versus Big Ten crossover as they head down to Minneapolis to take on Penn State on September 9th, and then they play host Minnesota on September 10th. Then Stanford kind of continues its Big Ten swing when they play Louisville on September 18th, another Sunday. I'm sorry, not not... I'm jumping ahead. They play Louisville on September 18th, 
But before then, they play Nebraska at Nebraska in, on September 13th. So right there and then, those three, those six matchups at Florida, home against Texas, versus Penn State at in Minnesota, at Minnesota, at Nebraska, and home against Louisville. That is the most brutal six-game stretch I have ever seen. As honestly, Stanford is gonna have their hands full, but they're gonna be very much battle tested. Mike Pat says, "Does Florida have? Does University of Florida have a good volleyball team?" Asking for a friend, they do actually have a good volleyball team. Year in and year out, they have a good volleyball team, and I kind of allotted this a couple weeks ago. Florida does have a decent chance of winning the SEC. Now, it still is Kentucky's to possibly win, just because Kentucky is perennially good, and they're mainly consistent. But I give Florida a decent chance. Back to Stanford. Stanford kicks off the Pac-12 schedule on September 21st, a Wednesday, at Cal, when they take on its NorCal rival. And then on September 25th, Stanford will be hitting the road to Eugene to take on Oregon. Then September 30th and October 2nd, Stanford has... The Washington schools at home, starting off with Washington on that September 30th match. And then October 2nd, Stanford plays Washington State. Then Stanford hits the road to take on Colorado and Utah on October 7th and 9th. Then Stanford will remain on the road to take on the Arizona schools. Arizona on October 14th and Arizona State on October 16th. Then Stanford plays the Southern California schools as Stanford plays UCLA on October 21st and then USC on October 23rd. Then Stanford is at Washington State on October 28th and at Washington on October 30th. Then Stanford has two home games, one against Utah on November 4th and then November 6th, Stanford plays Colorado. Then Stanford will be will have a road game against the SoCal schools. November 10th, they are at USC, and then November 12th, they are at UCLA. I'm going to try to go to that USC match just because I went th- to that match last year, and while USC did get spanked by Stanford, it was still fun to attend. Anyway, Stanford closed out the SoCal matchups on the road against UCLA on November 12th. Then Stanford has its last four games at home, starting with the Arizona schools on November 18th, where they play Arizona State. Then November 20th, Stanford plays Arizona. Then Stanford will remain at home on November 23rd against Oregon State. And then Stanford closes out its season on November 25th, a Friday, against Cal. So those six matchups that I mentioned in the non-conference schedule, that's going to really toughen up Stanford for when they play that Pac-12 conference schedule. That's because I want to say, and this is a little early to tell, but I think Stanford has the toughest non-conference schedule in the Pac-12. And that is going to be a benefit for them, just because they do have quite a bit of talent returning. They have Cami Miner running the offense, Kendall Kipp returning as one of its top hitters. Then you also have Alex Lugier, who returns, and then you have other top players such as Sammy Francis, who had a stellar freshman season, Katie Baird, who was basically the right-hand woman to Kendall Kemp, and then Elena Ogilive. I feel I'm mispronouncing that, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, but Elena Ogilive is the libero as she returns as well. So overall for Stanford, They do have a lot of promise this year, and they didn't lose much from last year's team. I think Stanford can do damage this season in the Pac-12. I could kind of go as far as to say they could be the early favorite to win the Pac-12. That is my guess, but I'm not going to make that a full-on promise, just because Stanford does... They obviously are going to get challenged early on, and they're facing quite a bit of talent from the other side in that non-conference schedule. They're facing a team that made the finals in Nebraska. Then they're facing a team that made the final four, being Louisville, which only lost one match, which was in the semifinals. And then you also have Florida, which made it to the Sweet 16. Penn State, which made it to the round of 32. Minnesota, the team that knocked them out. That's going to be fresh in Stanford's mind. That team made the Elite Eight. And then Penn State... 
I, I, I already said Penn State made the the uh, round of 32, and overall, I think that's going to be a tough schedule to start out. And yeah, I, I nailed everything. And then Texas made the Elite Eight. That that was that was the team I was forgetting about. But Texas made the Elite Eight. So made the may the volleyball gods be in the favor of Stanford because following Tennessee State, it's going to be tough. So that is that for Stanford schedule right there. Let's jump on over to the Big Ten where we have Nebraska's schedule that was just released. I'm actually going to go over the non-conference matches just because I'm going to save the conference matches for a different segment as Nebraska opens up its schedule, its season against Texas A&M Corpus Christi on August 26th. And then later that same day, Nebraska plays Tulsa, and then they close out the Nebraska Invitational against Pepperdine. I kind of already allotted to that when it came to Pepperdine's schedule. Then Nebraska will continue its homestand when they play in the Emer- Emeritus Players Challenge when they play Loyola Marymount or LMU on September 1st. Then they play Ole Miss on September 3rd, which I think is going to be a fun matchup. I think Ole Miss is a little underrated. I think that could be a little bit of a challenge, but I think Pepperdine, I feel, poses more of a threat than Ole Miss. Not that I'm saying Ole Miss is bad, but I just think Pepperdine just has more must. My horses in the back when it comes to their offense. That's just me. Then Nebraska plays Creighton in Omaha on September 7th. That Creighton matchup is going to be a fun matchup. Obviously, it's an interstate rivalry as the Blue Jays and the Huskers will be playing in Omaha in the Chi Health Center. I'm glad they continue to have this rivalry. Obviously, this one is probably going to favor the Huskers, but you never know with the Blue Jays. They return quite a bit of good talent on their team. And here's probably the most mind-boggling matchup that Nebraska scheduled. Nebraska has a home matchup on September 10th against Long Beach State. Now, when I saw this matchup, this made complete sense to me. You're probably wondering, well, why would Nebraska schedule Long Beach State of all schools? you got to remember that Long Beach State is coached by Tyler Hildebrand, who was an assistant coach for Nebraska the past, what, three years? Back when they won the championship back in 2017 or something like that. Either way, Tyler Hildebrand will make his return to Lincoln, Nebraska on September 10th when his Long Beach State team takes on Nebraska. And then as I allowed to in the Stanford schedule, Nebraska plays Stanford at Nebraska on September 13th. Then Nebraska has a big challenge on their hands when they play at Kentucky to close out non-conference play on September 18th. That Kentucky matchup is going to be very fun. Now, here's my thing. I think Nebraska has that match. I wouldn't say it's locked up, but... I give them a very good shot at knocking off Kentucky. Kentucky lost quite a bit of its players due to graduation and the transfer portal. And then Nebraska returns quite a bit of its players from last year. And they have such a good recruiting class. Some of that good recruiting class played in the Pan Am Cup last week and helped the U.S. win gold. So obviously they're going to have their feet wet when it comes to that. So that is Nebraska's non-conference schedule right there. And... That is pretty much that when it comes to the schedule breakdowns. All in all, when it comes to this, we're getting closer and closer to the season, and I'm very excited. I really can't wait to see what some of these teams have to offer. Now let's get on into the Pac- – not the Pac-12, the Big Ten Volleyball Conference schedule. So this is going to be a beast of a schedule to tackle. So this will probably be it for when it comes to the schedule breakdowns. And then we'll probably head to our commercial break. And then we'll go from there. So here's the Big Ten Volleyball schedule. Starting off on Friday, September 23rd. That's when all of the teams face one another. So the matchups are as follows. Indiana at Penn State, Maryland at Illinois, Ohio State at Iowa, Maryland at 
Illinois. Ah. <laughs> okay, let, let's take it from the top. Indiana at Penn State. Maryland at Illinois. Michigan State at Nebraska. Minnesota at Purdue. Nebraska at Wisconsin. Ohio State at Iowa. And those are your matchups. The ones that jump out at me is, clear, first of all, the one that, I'm sorry, not Nebraska at Wisconsin, Northwestern at Wisconsin. Come on, Taryn. So the one that jumps out at me when it comes to this whole thing, probably Minnesota at Purdue. That one's going to be the big one that everyone's going to have their eyes on. Minnesota at Purdue is going to be a real fun matchup. And then and then Michigan at Rutgers. I forgot about that. Michigan at Rutgers is also going to be playing. So just to reiterate, the first week will be Indiana at Penn State, Maryland at Illinois, Michigan at Rutgers, Michigan State at Nebraska, Minnesota at Purdue, Northwestern at Wisconsin, Ohio State at Iowa. And then on Saturday, September 24th, we have Michigan at Penn State, Northwestern at Illinois, and Ohio State at Nebraska. So the Ohio State at Nebraska matchup is going to be very fun. I think those are the two teams that's going to basically be duking it out for the Big Ten Conference style. I've been hearing one side saying Ohio State's going to win it, and then I'm going to hear the other side that says Nebraska returns their, most of their players. Just because, based on number of returnees and their recruiting class, I really think Nebraska is going to be very tough to take down come Big Ten Conference play. Ohio State does return a good portion of its players as well, but honestly, can they really keep up with Nebraska? That's going to be the million-dollar question. And then on, like I said, that Saturday, September 24th matchup, we had Northwestern at Illinois. I think that's an underrated matchup. Obviously, you love the Illinois rivalry match, so I'm going to really enjoy that. And then also Michigan at Penn State. You can't go wrong with that as well. As we welcome John Felipe in the chat room, he says, getting my volleyball on tonight. Great to have you in the chat room, buddy. Unfortunately, I am not talking ACC, which means I'm not talking North Carolina or Duke, but I am talking some Big Ten. So if you have any Big Ten schools that you like, there you go. So jumping over to Sunday, September 25th, we have Indiana at Maryland, Michigan State at Rutgers, Purdue at Iowa, and Wisconsin at Minnesota. So the Wisconsin at Minnesota matchup is probably the match of the day right there. I think it's going to be a crucial matchup for the Bet for the Badgers and the Gophers, I think both of those teams are going to give it their all. And then on Wednesday, September 28th, we have Iowa at Indiana, then Nebraska at Minnesota, then Ohio State at Michigan. So Ohio State-Michigan needs no introduction. Both of those two teams are basically bitter rivals. Then we have Nebraska at Minnesota, another Big time test for Minnesota. Minnesota is going to get tested very heavily as you look at that, those first three matchups. At Purdue, then home against Wisconsin, and then I did it again. <laughs> I got Nebraska and Northwestern mixed up. So Nebraska is not playing Minnesota. It's Northwestern playing at Minnesota. I'm sorry the NUs are, get, are, are mixing me up when – it clearly has N-E-B instead of N-U. So Northwestern at Minnesota is going to be played on Wednesday, September 28th. So run it back the match, running back the matches on Wednesday, September 28th, Iowa at Indiana, Northwestern at Minnesota, and Ohio State at Michigan. So Ohio State at Michigan is probably the matchup to watch for. But, once again, Minnesota is being battle-tested early on in the Big Ten as they're at Purdue in their first match and then home against Wisconsin in the second. That's a tough draw right there. Jumping over to Friday, September 30th, we have Michigan State at Maryland, then Nebraska at Rutgers, Penn State at Wisconsin, 
Purdue at Illinois rounds off the matchups for that day. Penn State Wisconsin is going to be fun, and you can't go wrong with Purdue at Illinois. I think Illinois is a little underrated, and you got to remember Illinois knocked off Kentucky and advanced to the Sweet 16. So I think that Illinois team is going to show some promise this year. I think Illinois could be the surprise team in the Big Ten. I think that could be the dark horse. We'll see. Then, starting off the month of October, we have Iowa at Minnesota, Michigan at Northwestern, for real this time, Nebraska at Maryland, and Ohio State at Indiana. Nothing really stands out to me, but I kind of give Nebraska at Maryland a little something to get excited for, just because Maryland did have a promising team last year. They had a team that went undefeated in non-conference play. Then they knocked off Wisconsin in the first match of the Big Ten play last year. And then that was kind of it, because they didn't really have that same mojo that they had following that win over Nebraska. So, I'm sorry, not Nebraska, Wisconsin. But I think Maryland could potentially could potentially have a little bit of a challenge on their hands. I definitely think Nebraska is going to beat Maryland, but you never know what could happen. Like, who knows? Maybe Maryland pulls off that upset. Then jumping over to Sunday, October 2nd, we have Illinois at Wisconsin, Michigan State at Penn State, and Rutgers at Purdue. So nothing really jumps out to me too much other than Illinois at Wisconsin. Jumping over to Wednesday, October 5th, we have Iowa at Purdue and Wisconsin at Indiana. Considering it's a two a Wednesday slate, there's nothing really jumping out at me. And that that's basically a tentative schedule right there. It could get moved around. Heaven forbid it doesn't. We'll see. Then jumping over to Friday, October 7th, we have Illinois at Maryland, Minnesota at Michigan, Nebraska at Michigan State, Penn State at Ohio State, and Rutgers at Northwestern. So the one that clearly jumps out at me is Penn State at Ohio State. We all know the true rivalry of what we're going to get when it comes to the Nittany Lions and the Buckeyes. And then Minnesota at Michigan is kind of underrated as well. I think Michigan doesn't get the same rap as the other Big Ten Conference teams do just because Michigan doesn't do as great as some of the other teams in the conference do. I mean, Michigan did get bounced out of the first round of the NCAA tournament by Ball State, a team that hadn't won an NCAA tournament game since the 90s. So I think there's some promise in Michigan. Jumping over to Saturday, October 8th, we have Indiana at Iowa, Nebraska at Michigan, and Wisconsin at Purdue. So for those of you that remember, Purdue beat Wisconsin twice last year in Big Ten Conference play, and they almost derailed the hopes of the Badgers winning the Big Ten Conference. Fortunately for the Badgers, they were able to right the ship and win the the matches that needed to be won in Big Ten Conference play. So Wisconsin at Purdue is going to be a barn burner right there. I also think Nebraska at Michigan is vastly underrated, so there's that right there. Then on Sunday, October 9th, we have Illinois at Penn State, Maryland at Rutgers, Minnesota at Michigan State, Northwestern at Ohio State, Rounds off the Sunday, October 9th matchups. So, nothing kind of jumps out at me other than Illinois at Penn State. Jumping over to Wednesday, October 12th, we have Ohio State at Minnesota and Rutgers at Illinois. Ohio State-Minnesota is going to be a fun Wednesday matchup right there. Always going to have going to be good to have that Wednesday matchup, which I think that could be decisive between... Ohio State at Minnesota. (laughs) Jumping over to Friday, October 14th, we have Maryland at Northwestern, Michigan at Michigan State, Penn State at Nebraska, and Purdue Purdue at Indiana, 
and Wisconsin at Iowa. So let's get this out of the way. Purdue at Indiana and Michigan at Michigan State. Rivalry games, you got to love them. Interstate rivalry games, those are your matchups to watch for. Oh, also, we have this nice little matchup between Nebraska and Penn State. Another big-time matchup to watch for. I kind of leaned toward the Huskers in that matchup just because Penn State lost so much to the transfer portal. And they also have a new first-year head coach following Russ Rose. So you also have to add that to the equation as well. Saturday, October 15th, consists of Illinois at Minnesota, then Penn State at Iowa, and then Rutgers at Ohio State. Illinois at Minnesota is kind of the matchup that jumps out at me because, like I said, Illinois is kind of that dark horse team from the Big Ten, and then Minnesota is kind of that perennial team that does good year in and year out. Also, Minnesota, I think they're a dark horse to win the Big Ten, but I would not sleep on them. And then on Sunday, October 16th, we have Maryland at Purdue, Michigan at Wisconsin, Michigan State at Indiana, and Northwestern at Nebraska. Uh, Nothing really jumps out at me other than Michigan at Wisconsin, which I think can be sneaky good. So we'll jump on ahead to Wednesday, October 19th. We have Illinois at Ohio State, Minnesota at Iowa, Nebraska at Purdue, and those are your matchups right there. (laughs) So Nebraska at Purdue right there, big-time matchup right there. I think Nebraska is going to come ready to go, but winning at Purdue is going to be a challenge. But you never can't count out a John Cook team. Jumping on over to Friday, October 21st, we have Indiana at Michigan, Michigan State at Wisconsin, Northwestern at Rutgers, Penn State at Maryland closes out that matchup of that matchups of the day. So eh, nothing really jumps out at me, which screams primetime matchup. Jumping over to Saturday, October 22nd, we have Iowa at Ohio State, Nebraska at Illinois, Northwestern at Maryland, and Purdue at Minnesota. Purdue at Minnesota is going to be the fun matchup right there. I think it's going to be a great battle between the Boilermakers and the Gophers. Also can't go wrong with Nebraska at Illinois. It's going to be a rematch of the Sweet 16 matchup, which Nebraska kind of dominated. But, again, Illinois, I think, has a lot of promise this season. I think a lot can happen with the fighting in Lion-Eye. Jumping over to Sunday, October 23rd, we have Indiana at Michigan State, Rutgers at Penn State, and Wisconsin at Michigan. Wisconsin at Michigan is kind of the only matchup that I think screams big-time matchup. But other than that, let's move on. Wednesday, October 26th, we have Michigan at Ohio State, Michigan State at Minnesota, Nebraska at Wisconsin, and Penn State at Illinois. Nebraska at Wisconsin. There you go. That is your big-time matchup right there. Wisconsin is going to come. I think Wisconsin is going to have to be prepared for Nebraska. Because Nebraska is going to come in with a lot of vengeance on their mind. And honestly, even though it's going to be at Wisconsin, I really think Nebraska has so much talent that they bring in and so much talent that they return. Also, Ohio State at Penn State, you cannot go wrong with just because Ohio State Penn State is. I'm sorry, not Ohio State Penn State. Ohio State Michigan is always a, t- a fun rivalry right there. And I think it's going to be a good time. And then Penn State at Illinois is going to be an underrated matchup right there. So Friday, October 28th, we have Maryland at Iowa, Purdue at. Northwestern and Rutgers at Indiana. Nothing really jumps out at me. Jumping to Saturday, October 29th, we have Maryland at Nebraska, Minnesota at Wisconsin, Ohio State at Penn State, and that's your matchups. (laughs) So Ohio State at Penn State is the matchup that screams primetime right there. However, Minnesota at Wisconsin also is another primetime matchup right there when it comes to the Big Ten. Jumping on over to Sunday, October 30th, we have Illinois at Rutgers, Indiana at Purdue, Iowa at Northwestern, Michigan State at Michigan. 
concludes those October 30th matches. So Michigan, Michigan State at Michigan, as well as Indiana at Purdue. Those are your fun. Those are your fun rivalry matchups right there. You can't go wrong with those. And those are your matchups to pretty much watch for on October 30th. Then November 2nd, we have Indiana at Nebraska, Maryland at Penn State. And those are your only two matchups. So nothing really jumps out at me just because it's only a Wednesday. Jumping to October 4th, a Friday, we have Iowa at Rutgers, Michigan at Minnesota, Ohio State at Northwestern, Purdue at Michigan State, and Wisconsin at Illinois. Wisconsin at Illinois, I think, is going to be sneaky good. And I kind of think that's it. Michigan at Minnesota is also a little sneaky good, as jumping over to Saturday, November 5th, we have Michigan State, or Ohio State at Michigan State, which doesn't really scream big-time matchup, but you never know with Michigan State. Jumping over to Sunday, October 6th, we have Indiana at Wisconsin, Iowa at Maryland, Minnesota at Illinois, Nebraska at Northwestern, Penn State at Rutgers, and Purdue at Michigan. Um, I guess Minnesota at Illinois is the one that stands out to me. Other than that, nothing isn't isn't really at the peak of my flavor. But I could be wrong. Jumping over to Friday, November 11th, Veterans Day, we have Illinois at Michigan State. Every team is playing, by the way. Illinois at Michigan State, Iowa at Nebraska, Maryland at Minnesota, Northwestern at Michigan, Ohio State at Purdue, Penn State at Indiana, and Rutgers at Wisconsin. Honestly, Ohio State at Purdue is going to be very fun. It's going to be a barn burner. Guarantee it. Then on November 12th, we have Illinois at Michigan, Maryland at Wisconsin, Northwestern at Michigan State, Penn State at Purdue to round off the November 12th matchups. Penn State at Purdue is probably the standout matchup right there. And then that's it. I guess Michigan-Illinois is also underrated, but... It's, it's underrated, but it's not noteworthy. So Sunday, November 13th, we have Indiana at Minnesota, Nebraska at Ohio State, and Rutgers at Iowa. So Nebraska at Ohio State is the primetime matchup for the day. Maybe the primetime matchup of the weekend, just because Ohio State-Nebraska is going to be barn burner material. And honestly, if you have the Big Ten Network, check out that matchup. Friday, November 18th, consists of Michigan at Purdue, Michigan State at Illinois, Minnesota at Penn State, Nebraska at Iowa, Northwestern at Indiana, Ohio State at Maryland, and closing out the week is Wisconsin and Rutgers. Or closing out the day is Wisconsin at Rutgers. So looking at it, Minnesota at Penn State is definitely the standout matchup right there. Michigan at Purdue is also underrated as well. So that's kind of my opinion. Then on Saturday, November 19th, we have Michigan at Maryland and then Minnesota at Rutgers. And then also Wisconsin at Penn State. Wisconsin at Penn State is also going to be very fun. I think that's kind of... Even though Penn State did lose a lot to graduation, I think it's going to be a sneaky good matchup, considering Wisconsin also lost a lot to graduation as well. They're going to have a new identity, but I think they're going to be just as good. Sunday, November 20th, consists of Indiana and Ohio State, Iowa at Illinois, Michigan State at Northwestern, and then Purdue at Nebraska. Purdue at Nebraska is going to be prime time. I think it's going to be your big-time matchup to watch for that Sunday. I don't think anyone is going to be taking it easy on anyone. The crowd is going to be hyped up. It's going to be electric. Lincoln is going to be bumping and jumping. It's going to be bonkers, poggers, bananas, you name it. So jumping over to November 23rd, on Wednesday, we have Illinois... At Indiana, 
Michigan at Iowa, Penn State at North Northwestern, Purdue at Maryland, and Rutgers at Michigan State. Uh, tough to really say which one stands out. I guess, you know what? To be nice, I'll give... I'll give Michigan at Iowa the match to watch for, and then Michigan State at Rutgers, or Rutgers at Michigan State, another match to watch for as well. So, those are your noteworthy matchups. Considering I have, I need to show a little love to Rutgers and Iowa. Then jumping over to Friday, November 25th, we have Minnesota at Ohio State, Purdue at Penn State, Rutgers at Michigan, and Wisconsin at Nebraska. Wisconsin, Nebraska, round two, super fun. It's going to be in Lincoln, and honestly, like I said, Lincoln, Nebraska is going to be bumping, jumping. It's going to be bananas, poggers, mind-blowing. It's basically going to be chaos, absolutely jaw-dropping. And then Purdue at Penn State is not that bad of a matchup. I think it's sneaky good as well as Minnesota at Ohio State. This week, that day, those days, that day, those matchups on November 25th, legit. Those are your matchups to really watch for. And then closing out the Big Ten volleyball schedule, we have Illinois at Northwestern, Iowa at Michigan State, Maryland at Illinois, or Maryland at Indiana, Minnesota at Nebraska, and Wisconsin at Ohio State. Wisconsin at Ohio State, that is your primetime material matchup. You also have Illinois at Northwestern, which is an underrated matchup, the battle of the the Illinois teams. And then also, you can't go wrong with Minnesota at Nebraska. And then there's also a, a day for makeup matches on Sunday, November 27th. But that is that for the Big Ten women's volleyball schedule. I know it was a lot to take in, and I know I kind of stumbled across the way. If anyone wants a copy of the Big Ten women's volleyball schedule, the whole conference schedule, just let me know. I'll send it to you. Then we got to get into the poll of the Big Ten women's volleyball schedule that I had last Tuesday. So there were 19 people that voted on Twitter, and I really do appreciate the 19 people that voted. But the final results consisted of, I said on the Twitter poll, who will win the Big Ten Women's Volleyball Conference. I put Ohio State, Wisconsin, and Nebraska as options, and then I put someone else and then comment, which no one decided to vote for, spoiler. But with 47% of the votes, you the people on Twitter – that voted, decided to pick as your conference champion, drumroll please, Nebraska. So you all picked Nebraska to win the Big Ten Women's Volleyball Champion, the Big Ten Women's Volleyball Conference this year. Honestly, it makes a whole lot of sense to pick Nebraska just because they returned so much this season and they have a great recruiting class. I really think that this is going to be a very promising season for the Huskers, especially since they came oh so close to winning it last year. So Nebraska is definitely the safe choice. I honestly would not sleep on Ohio State. Ohio State does have a lot of talent. Wisconsin returns a good chunk of its talent and got quite a bit from the transfer portal. And you have some of the other teams like Minnesota, Illinois, Penn State as your dark horse teams. And then Purdue is also good, as always. So overall, I think the Big Ten is going to be a fun conference this year. I don't think there's going to be any matches, even though I did have some comments that said, or even though I kind of said there weren't any matches that jumped out to me. But I think no conference match from the Big Ten is going to be a cakewalk. So that is that for the Big Ten Women's Volleyball Conference breakdown. And let's take ourselves a quick little commercial breaky break when we come back. We will have the VNL to discuss on the women's volleyball side of things. And then we have some NVA to recap as the season is getting closer and closer to its end of the regular season. So you are listening to Set Point here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all the sports. We'll be right back after this.
What's up, sports fans? Are you looking for the latest on Northern California sports? Then take a trip out west with me, your host, Gina G, on Reppin' the NorCal Sports, right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. I'll be bringing it to you all the way live every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. And it's always a packed show. I'll bring you everything Dynastic 49ers, the bite of the San Jose Sharks, torture of the San Francisco Giants, the Golden State Warriors that we still believe. Then take you across the bay to the rise and grind of the Oakland A's. I've got you covered on college ball from the Cal Bears to the Stanford Cardinal, so that no matter what, reppin' the NorCal sports is always reppin' the bay. So if you bleed red and gold, or you're looking to keep an eye out west in them thar hills, don't miss me, Gina G, on reppin' the NorCal sports. Catch me every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, and I'll have your fandom repped harder than a trio of Defenders Garden Stephen Curry before his buzzer beater is Gucci. going on everybody my name is harrison glazer and we're coming at you from the show that never sleeps podcast i cover the jets the islanders the nets and the yankees this is pierre moss and i cover the mets knicks rangers and the giants our show is live every wednesday through spreaker and a bunch of other ways to get our content Again, we're the show that never sleeps podcast. We talk about all those New York sports. It's a lot of fun. We get into all of it. Please tune in. Again, that's Wednesdays at 6 p.m. And we look forward to having you guys right here on Night Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Sports fans, do you like teams that are tough, cities that are tougher, and fan bases that are passionate about their teams? How about teams that are historic and stadiums that are iconic? Then you belong in Chicago, and you need to check out Chi Town Weekly. Join me, Adam Kernan, every week as we keep up with all things Chicago sports. Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks. Cubs, White Sox, we'll cover them all plus more. The Windy City is always buzzing, and we'll keep you up on all the big games and major stories. So tune in to Chi Town Weekly every week right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports.
ladies and gentlemen. My name is Davidson. It's your boy, the entire lot. And we are the hosts of Fast Break here on IE Sports Radio, where we discuss everything in the world of basketball from prep to the pros. You guys definitely check us out, man. Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We got all the basketball information you guys need. So we look forward to you guys listening in. And please do, because we are the best basketball show on this side of the Mississippi. And please do check us out on Twitter at Fast Break ISR. D Lock. Where's our time again? 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. That gives you guys spending time on a Sunday. Tune in. Have to give a big shout out to Fast Break for surpassing 100 episodes. Congratulations to Fast Break. You are part of the 100 episode club. And we look forward to hearing 100 more episodes of Fast Break with Davidson Crooks and Deterius Law. Welcome back to Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. Definitely check out all of our shows, such as Shy Town Weekly, which goes on an hour before this show comes on. Also check out the show that never sleeps with Harrison Glazer and Peter Moss. And also check out Rep into NorCal Sports with Gina G. And she will be talking about the Golden State Warriors winning the NBA championship tomorrow. I can guarantee it. Now let's jump on in to segment number two of Set Point. Let's start with the VNL before we head off to the NVA. So the VNL on the women's side resumed as the U.S. returned to its dominating, I wouldn't say dominating glory, but I would say they would they returned to pretty much their strong, their strong standing. So they started off the week when they defeated Bulgaria in three sets. This was following their three-set loss to Japan. They won the match against Bulgaria 25-20, 25-22, and 25-20. Also, they played Poland the day after. They won that matchup in straight sets 25-12, 25-21, 25-16. Then they had a, a kind of a big challenge as they played China on September, June, September, June 18th, where, the, to everyone's surprise, the U.S. swept China 25-21, 25-23 and 25-21 behind a big game from Catherine Plummer, the former Stanford standout who led Stanford to three, count them, three national championships. And then the U.S. closed out the week with a four-set win over Thailand. They lost the first set 25-17, but won the next three sets 25-13, 25-23, and 25-18. They got a big game from Ali Fronti, the former Penn State standout which was huge considering they need all the players to step up. We welcome Andrew Hegenbaugh into the live chat. He says, hope I'm having a great show. Thank you, Andrew. Definitely do check out the Soccer Scoreboard Show and the State of Ohio Sports with Andrew Hegenbaugh. He does an awesome job with both those shows. So that's so back to the U.S. in terms of the VNL. That's the good news that they were able to basically get back on track. The not-so-good news is that they're still behind Japan in terms of the standings, as Japan didn't really, you know, veer away from wanting to remove itself from being atop the standings. Japan was able to defeat Poland in three sets, Bulgaria in three sets, Thailand in three sets, and they they defeated China in four sets, which I was kind of surprised that that one didn't go five. And I was a little surprised to see China not beating Japan. I guess Japan is just much better than everyone gives them credit for. And Japan is the real deal. Like, there's a reason why they were able to defeat the U.S. And there's a reason why Japan did not doesn't have any losses. They're a perfect eight and zero. And honestly, Japan is just not slowing down for every for anybody. So overall, I think it's going to be quite fun for the U.S. to try to catch up to Japan. I think that Japan is – I think Japan's probably the team to beat with one more week remaining in the VNL before pl- playoff time or the knockout round. So I really think that the U.S. is going to have to kick it – up a notch, but honestly, I think they're they're totally fine. I think the U.S. is, I think the U.S. is indeed going to have a much better time 
now that they kind of got that bad loss out of the way, they've kind of shuffled around some of their lineup as they had a few players get switched out as they had a few other players come in, such as Catherine Plummer. So their last week is going to be in Calgary, Canada, when they play on June 29th against Belgium. And then on June 30th, they play Serbia, which is a Thursday, the day after. And then on Saturday, July 2nd, the U.S. plays Turkey. And then... I think they got this wrong. I, I, they, they put July 4th, but it's supposed to be Sunday, July 3rd, which the U.S. plays Germany. And then the finals of the VNL are July, 7, July 13th through the 17th in Ankara, Turkey. So that's pretty much that for the U.S. right there. Um, for the most part, I don't see how the U.S. doesn't make it into the knockout round, which... I'm pretty sure they'll be just fine when it comes to making the knockout round. Looking at their next matchup against the Netherlands, the Netherlands are near the bottom of the standings, which I think they should be fine against. Or, I'm sorry, that's not... I'm sorry. I'm looking at the wrong matchup right there. My apologies. They Their next matchup is against Bel, Belgium, which, for Belgium, they are near the low middle part of the pack. Belgium is 12th when it comes to the standings. And then when it comes to Serbia, the U.S. will be playing a Serbia team that is 7th in the standings at the moment. That could be a challenging matchup right there, but who's to say? And then closing out, they have Turkey, which Turkey is going to get even tougher. The Turkey matchup is going to be tougher than the Serbia matchup, in my honest opinion. And then they close out the match or the VNL regular season or re- the regular round robin conference thingy against Germany, which is near the bottom of the pack. So for the U.S., they should pretty much be in control of making the knockout round. I don't see how the U.S. doesn't make the knockout round. I guess maybe Turkey would be probably stiff competition, if not Serbia. The only way I see the U.S. losing any of these matches is them resting most of their players. Like, it happened last year when Karch Karai decided to rest a majority of his players, and then everyone decided to flip out and be like, Oh my god! Why did the U.S. get swept in their last match of the, C- of the VNL? It's like, haven't you ever heard of resting your players so they don't get freaking injured? <clears throat> but I digress. So anyway, the U.S. currently, like I said, they currently rest in second place behind Japan. Brazil is third behind the U.S. as they actually lost to Italy this past Saturday as they lost in four sets. They lost the first two sets, 25-17 and 25-15. They won the third set, 25-14, but then they lost the fourth set, 25-14. Julia Bergman is still doing great things for Brazil but she can't really do it all by herself. I admit, I haven't really been paying too much attention to Brazil, but honestly, Brazil always is a good team. I would not be surprised if Brazil gave the U.S. a battle to remember when it comes to the knockout round. I think Brazil is going to be really good when it comes to the knockout round. Obviously, Brazil is still trying to find their identity, but I think they will be just fine. So this week, the VNL men's volleyball matches return as, honestly, the U.S. is still in first place, and I don't think we should be, I don't think we should be too worried, honestly, but you also have to wonder if Japan could catch fire at any point. My only fear for the U.S. men's team is that they get a little too much of a big head following their matchup against Brazil because that was a huge win and they did have the week off. So this week they are playing against Serbia, which Serbia looking at the standings, they're ninth in the standings, which is basically middle of the pack. And then against Iran, Iran is a little bit lower 
from the middle of the pack when it comes to the VNL men's volleyball standings. And then following the the Iran matchup, Bulgaria. Bulgaria is pretty much below. <laughs> They're near the bottom of the standings when it comes to the VNL men's side of things. And then closing out the week, the U.S. plays Poland, which Poland, that is going to be a major jump from of talent. Poland is going to be a challenge right there just because they're 3-1. and one. They're itching for a big win. And more importantly, I really think that Poland does have the potential to hang with these talented teams such as Italy, France, and Japan. So the U.S. did some shuffling around of the teams. They did bring in a few players such as TJ DeFalco. And honestly, good for TJ. He was on the... U.S. Olympic national team, which I'm glad he's able to get that his chance to be able to play. So we shall see what happens when it comes to the U.S. this week. And here's hoping that the U.S. is able – here's hoping for the U.S.'s sake they're able to, you know, continue their winning ways. Because I really think that the U.S. is doing great on – great in terms of the men's side, but there's still plenty of of meat left on the bone. And I really think it's going to be something to watch for when it comes to the U.S. And here's hoping that they are able to keep serve when it comes to their team. So there's that right there. So that is that for the VNL for this week and the VNL women's side from last week. Now it is that time to jump on in to the NVA. Event number four has concluded as it did not disappoint. We'll start off with the Friday matchups. We have the Las Vegas Ramblers taking on the Dallas Tornadoes. The Ramblers actually came in shorthanded as they did not have Jordan Hoppy and a few of its other players so the Las Vegas Ramblers had to depend on one other player to step up. This player just so happened to be none other than Nick England. Yes, Nick England, the play-by-play commentator along with Ira Thor when it comes to the NVA commentating. He wasn't commenting during the match. He was playing for the Ramblers as he had to do a lot to help the Ramblers inch closer and closer to claiming the American the American Conference, as well as its own division. But early on, it was it was not easy. The Dallas Tornadoes took the first set 28-26, to and it looked as if the Tornadoes were ready to blow the Ramblers away. No pun intended. However, the Ramblers got back on track. Nick England had himself a monster game. He put down 14 kills. Also, the Ramblers got help from Brandon Rattray, who just came back from injury, as the Ramblers took the second set 25-15. The Ramblers rambled on in that third set, 25-19. And then set four, the Ramblers, despite getting a tough challenge from the Tornadoes, they were able to take down the Tornadoes 25-21 in that fourth set, ensuring that they clinch at least a share of the American Coastal Division, which gets them closer and closer to inching into the playoffs. Jumping on over to the next matchup, we have the Orange Kai Stunners versus the Chicago Untouchables. This was kind of a mismatch. The Stunners had come in want winning three in a row, while the Untouchables searching for answers, trying to get some sort of momentum going to make a late playoff push. Uh, this one was all Orange Kai Stunners. Matt Hilling played himself quite a great game, and Nick West was a beast in the middle. The Stunners won the match 25-15, 25-19, 25-21. Well, here's a four in a row for the Stunners following that Friday matchup. Next matchup we had was Southern Exposure versus the Texas Tyrants. Tyrants looking to inch closer and closer to winning the National Central Division while Southern Exposure trying to find answers and improve its playoff odds. Texas took the first set 25-20, but Southern Exposure brought the heat as they torched the Tyrants in set to 25-11. But then the third set, that seemed to be Texas's wake-up call as they won the third set 25-19. Texas also won the fourth set 25-21, ensuring the win over Southern Exposure. Texas did not have standout Gianluca Grasso as he was out with injury, but they did get Jose Malero back 
from injury, their libero. So Texas also battling some injuries here and there, but they're hoping to get back Gianluca Grosso next event. And then the last matchup of the day for Friday we had was the Utah Stingers taking on the Seattle Sasquatch. So this was another kind of a mismatched matchup right here. The Utah Stingers looking to try to inch closer and closer to winning the American Central Division while the Sasquatch trying to earn its second win of the, of the season. Stingers were not going to let this one slip through their wings as the Stingers swept the Sasquatch 25-19, 25-20, 25-18, Everything just clicked for the Stingers. They were able to beat the Sasquatch in less than 90 minutes as the Stingers went ahead in the American Central Conference by one game. So there was that for Friday's matchups. Jumping over to Saturday's matchups, we had Team Freedom taking on Los Angeles Blaze. The Freedom, or I'm sorry, not Team Freedom. I need to stop saying this. I need to say this correctly. New Jersey Freedom. I swear, before I get into this matchup, we need to stop having Team Freedom having its logo of Team Freedom and have them have their logo as New Jersey Freedom. Please, for the love of spicy hot Cheetos, please, 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 New Jersey Freedom, change your Twitter, your Instagram handle to New Jersey Freedom and not Team Freedom. I beg of you, please. It's going to get so confusing to mistake you as Team Freedom when you should be known as the New Jersey Freedom. Please! <laughs> okay. New Jersey Freedom taking on the Los Angeles Blaze. So the Freedom lo- staying un- looking to stay undefeated on the season. They are a perfect 6-0. The Blaze looking to inch closer and closer to locking up a playoff spot. The first set went the Freedom's way as Joe Norman, a.k.a. Joe Normus, had himself a monster of a game. But, they- but the Freedom got help in the middle. As their middle blockers were able to just dominate there, the Blaze, to their to their surprise, did not play Charles Belvin to start out, and Charles Belvin was their guy that pretty much gave them the energy. Though in the second set, the Blaze were able to take that second set 25-22, but from here on out, it was all New Jersey Freedom as they won the third set 25-18, then the fourth set 25-19 to remain undefeated on the season at 7-0. Once again, Joe Norman was a man on a mission, and then the middle blockers for the New Jersey Freedom were just absolutely amazing. Jumping over to the next matchup, we had the Las Vegas Ramblers taking on the Chicago Untouchables. The Untouchables trying to improve their playoff odds, while the Ramblers looking to lock up the division outright, ensuring that they get a spot into the NBA playoffs. The Ramblers also are trying to look to lock up the conference as a whole. But the Untouchables really made it tough. The Untouchables really made the Ramblers earn that victory. But the Ramblers were able to win ultimately in straight sets 29-27, 27-25, and 25-21. The Untouchables' playoff hopes were basically on life support. They needed the Inland Empire Matters to beat the Los Angeles Blaze in order for them to stay in playoff contention. Another loss for them was going into event number five would basically be the end of their playoff hopes. Sorry, Adam Karnick, but that's how it is. Jumping over to the third matchup, we had the Dallas Tornadoes taking on the Orange County Stunners. So the Stunners looking to win their fifth straight matchup, while the Tornadoes looking to get back on track when it comes to the American Central Conf- American Central Division. The Tornadoes did show promise in the first set, as they won at 25-17, Felix Chapman was just a beast for the Tornadoes, but the Stunners had other plans. Matt Hillen continued his brilliance. He not only hit the ball well, but he set the ball well, and he blocked the ball well. Eventually, the Stunners took that second set, 27-25, and that was a crucial second set because if the Stunners don't win that set, then the Tornadoes go up 2-0 in the match, and they're feeling pretty good about themselves. Third set. Tornadoes were being led by Felix Chapman. It was just set the ball to Felix Chapman. Chapman gets a kill. But then the Stunners were not going to have any of it. Nick West had to pull out his middle blocker Monday. And today is Monday. While this match was played on a Saturday, he did have his middle blocker Monday moments. Offensively and defensively. Eventually the Stunners took the third set 28-26. to 26. Another close call set 
for the Stunners. If they lose that set, then Dallas has to feel pretty good about themselves being up 2-1 and Felix Chapman having himself a monster game, possibly. But in the fourth set, the Stunners were able to run away with it as they did not allow Felix Chapman to get on fire as the Stunners limited him to... to I, want, I don't think he had too many kills. I, think, I want to say he had like four kills in that fourth set. Either way, the Stunners limited the Tornadoes offense. They had they forced the Tornadoes to go to other players as eventually the Stunners took the fourth set 25-20. They punched their ticket into the playoffs as they guaranteed them at least a wild card spot in the national conf- the national conference as the Stunners are still very much alive when it comes to winning the National Coastal Division. And then closing out the Saturday matchups, we had the Inland Empire Matadors taking on the Colorado Kraken. The Kraken looking to remain in contention for the American Central Division title, while the Matadors is trying to get some momentum whatsoever. So the first set, it looked as if Colorado was going to just bulldoze its way into winning the match, but one of their outside hitters came down awkwardly as it looked like he sprained his ankle off of a big kill attempt. He came back and eventually played throughout the most of the match, but he was not himself. The Kraken did take the first set 25-22, but then the Matadors had something to say about that. Eric Beatty, the former Stanford standout, was just pounding kill after kill, and then also they got some help from Jack Vanderbeek. The Matadors took the second set 25-12, which was actually the Kraken's Worst set they had lost all season. Now, keep in mind, the Colorado Kraken did are is an expansion team. The Colorado Kraken are a is an expansion team, and honestly, they had their worst match of the season. And Jacob Vanderbeek is his name, but the Inland Empire Matadors really let the Kraken have it in that second set. The third set was also type as Jacob Vanderbeek, not Jack Vanderbeek, was continuing to pound kill after kill, taking the pressure off of Eric Beatty. It was vice versa as well as Eric Beatty was continuing his strong momentum as the Matadors took the second, the third set, 25-22. It looked as if the Matadors were finally going to break through. But then set four, the Kraken needed to be released as Colorado did everything possible. They did everything correct. They had a balanced attack. They took the fourth set, 25-20. In set five, the Matadors raced out to an early lead. Once again, it was more Eric Beatty as he kept pounding kill after kill. Everyone thought, everyone on Colorado thought that it was going to be Jacob Vanderbeek going in for the kills. But this time, it was Eric Beatty. It looked as if the Matadors were basically home free. They led 14-10. They had multiple match points. But the Colorado Kraken ripped off three straight to pull within one at 14-13. But the Matadors were able to close the door courtesy of Vanderbeek. As the Matadors, they finally got that monkey off their backs, winning 15-13 in that fifth set and eventually winning the match in five sets. That match actually marked the first match that went five in event number four. As jumping over to Sunday, we had Southern Exposure taking on the Utah Stingers. The Stingers with a win would clinch at least a share of the American Central Division. While Southern Exposure trying to get some sort of victory under their belts. The Stingers really brought out the buzz in the first set as they won at 25-20. Southern Exposure rebounded nicely as they won that second set, 25-21. The third set was back and forth. It looked as if the Stingers were going to fly away with the win, but Southern Exposure had something to say about it. They were able to turn... They, they Despite losing a 24-21 lead, they were able to win the third set, 27-25, off of a successful challenge, which I think was a great challenge by the Southern Exposure coach as... Utah was called for a net violation at the end of the set or at the final point of set number three. So it looked as if Southern Exposure had the momentum, but Utah being the experienced team that it was, was not going to roll over as they took the fourth set 25-22 
Everyone thought that the Stingers were going to win this match, but some of the exposure had other plans. The exposure jumped out to an – it was just back and forth in the fifth set. And then Southern Exposure eventually found their breakthrough, and they eventually were able to outlast the Stingers in the fifth set, 15-13, to 13, as Southern Exposure finally got on the board in terms of its win – in terms of the win column, they put themselves in a decent position to be one of two wildcard teams in the American con- in the American Conference. The Utah Stingers miss out on an opportunity to become at least co-division champions, as they'll have to wait t- till event number five to become co-division champions. Jumping over to the next matchup, we had the Colorado Kraken taking on, taking on the New Jersey Freedom. A win for the Freedom would ensure them a, at least a share of the National Coastal co- Coastal Division, while the Kraken looking to try to improve its playoff hopes as well as looking to try to get back into the thick of it of the American Central Division. This one was all Team Freedom, as Team or New Jersey Freedom, as the Freedom basically picked up where they left off and won it in straight sets 25-22, 25-21, and 25-18. Joe Normus was his Joe Normus self, as he had himself quite the game. The New Jersey Freedom locked up at least a share of the... National Coastal Division. They'll have to go for the outright division title next event on November. On a, on, on not November. July 8th when they play the Chicago Untouchables. Then we had the next match of the night. We had the Seattle Sasquatch versus the Texas Tyrants. The Tyrants with a win would lock up the National Central Division. While the Sasquatch trying to keep its playoff hopes alive. The Tyrants, despite being very shorthanded, really showed the, showed the Sasquatch what for. Despite the first set being super close, the Tyrants were able to control most of the match. The Tyrants won the first set 25-23, and throughout the rest of the match, they were able to not be in any danger whatsoever. They won the second set 25-15, and they concluded by winning the third set 25-19, as they locked up the outright... National Central Division, ensuring their spot into the playoffs. They also remain one game back of the New Jersey Freedom when it comes to the top spot in the National Conference. Seattle Sasquatch playoff hopes are on life support as a win for the Los Angeles Blaze against the Inland Empire Matadors would ensure that the Sasquatch and the Untouchables would be eliminated from playoff contention. Speaking of the LA Blaze as well versus the Inland Empire Matadors, that was the final matchup of the night. The Inland Empire Matadors taking on the Los Angeles Blaze. The Blaze with a win would lock up a playoff spot, the last playoff spot in the National Conference, while the Inland Empire Matadors would try to put themselves in a situation where they would make the playoffs as a wild card team. The Matadors really brought in this match. Eric Beatty picked up where he left off as he kept pounding kill after kill. Same can be said for Jacob Vanderbeek. The Matadors took the first set 25-22, and then the second set they won at 25-21. And just like that, the, we had a new Matadors team. This was a completely new Matadors team that no one seems to recognize as the Matadors were just doing everything in their power to just dominate their way to possibly keeping their playoff hopes alive. The first set was actually 25-23, and the second set was 25-21. Then the third set, it was pretty tight, as the Blaze were trying to do everything in its power to try to keep themselves alive in the match. But the Matadors said, ole, 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 as they won the third set 25-22 behind some great kills from Vanderbeek, as the Matadors sweep the Blaze, which means the Matadors put themselves in another great position to try to make the NBA playoffs. They actually are tied with the Dallas Tornadoes and Southern Exposure for the two wildcard spots in the American Conference. The Utah Stingers have the number two seed as they lead their division at four and four. The Las Vegas Ramblers, like I said, they have locked up the number one seed as The Utah Stingers lost to Southern Exposure, ensured that the Ramblers would be the number one seed outright, as the Las Vegas Ramblers are 7-1, only lost one match on the season. 
And then Colorado Kraken is bringing up the rear at two and six. Despite the NVA, unfortunately, at this time, not updating their conference standings, the Matadors, Tornadoes, and Exposure are basically in a log jam. Only two of those three teams will make the playoffs. And you never know what could happen in the American Central Division. Like, that division is still up for grabs, as the Stingers and Tornadoes are in a great position to try to win that division. You can't count out the Kraken as well, as they're still in the thick of it. And then jumping over to the National Conference, the playoff picture for there is looking a lot more clear. The Freedom is looking closer and closer to being the number one seed from the National Conference. But you can't count out Texas. You cannot mess with Texas as the Tyrants, once they get healthy, are going to be a lean, mean, tyrant machine. And then you also cannot count out the Orange County Suns, the hottest team behind the Freedom as they have lost or they have won five in a row and they have done promising things. The Blaze, on the other hand, they missed a chance of winning the winning a spot into the playoffs as they are currently 3 and 5 but they do control their playoff destiny as all they need is the untouchables and sasquatch to lose one more match or they need themselves to win one more match to ensure themselves a spot in the big dance that right there is your NVA update and your playoff picture as the playoff picture is getting closer and closer to being 100% clear and that is going to do it for this week's episode of set point one more thing to post before we wrap up. I want to give a shout to former set point guest Craig Pizzanti as his son Jake has committed to play volleyball at Long Beach State, which is absolutely amazing. So congratulations to Jake Pizzanti on committing to play volleyball at Long Beach State. He is only a sophomore, mind you, so he still has two more years of high school following 2023 and 2024. Well, that's going to do it for set point. It is that time to drop the beat as I'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate. You feel me? Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for tuning in to set point. I really do appreciate you all tuning in. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I appreciate you. If you listen at any time, any point, anywhere, I appreciate you. I hope you all have a great rest of the week. Big shout to the chat room that tuned in. Andrew Hagenbaugh, Mike Pat, and John Felipe. I really do appreciate you all tuning in on the live chat. I really do appreciate everyone and your support of Step 20. If that's you, I'm going to out. You all have yourself a great rest of the week. The SoCal Supreme Court Show will be moving its day as Friday. I actually have some high school football to cover. Yes, high school football season is just around the corner. If you follow my personal Twitter account, at Sam Rodriguez1, it is in the description of the show. Also follow Set Point on Twitter, at Set underscore point, i.e. for all of your volleyball updates. That is pretty much that. Remember to wear your sunscreen because it is sunburn season. You don't want to have to break out that aloe vera because that is something no one wants to have to deal with. No one should ever have to deal with sunscreen. But other than that, you'll have yourself a great rest of the week. Enjoy the volleyball that's coming on. We may not have any ABP or NBA happening. We still have some DNL. I will see you all sometime down the road with the SoCal Supreme Court Show. Peace!